text for this morning's sermon is Mark 10, 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we continue our study through the Gospel of Mark, and we encounter yet another snapshot of our Savior. <clears throat> and in this snapshot, we see His grace and we see His power. Would you give us eyes? by the power of the Holy Spirit, to see Christ clearly. We pray this in his name. Amen. John Newton was born in London on July 24th, 1725. Most of you likely know something about Newton's story. And Newton had a godly mother who introduced him to the truth of God's word, but she died when he was seven. Shortly after, still as a very young man, Newton joined his father, a sea captain, and as he adapted to life as a sailor, he became a very immoral young man. Ultimately, Newton got involved in the slave trade where he participated in and witnessed horrific atrocities as scores of Africans were treated as animals to be bought and sold under his watch. Newton believed that he was converted to Christ during a very significant moment in 1748. A church historian, Stephen Nichols, writes, Then came March 21st, 1748. Newton was aboard the ship the Greyhound, and by then he was a seasoned sailor. But a terrible storm whipped up at sea. It racked the ship. Newton was asleep in his cabin, and a large burst of water came right through the wall of his room and woke him up. He spent the whole night furiously pumping water off the ship's deck, trying to keep the ship from going under. Some of his fellow sailors lost their lives, but Newton managed to survive. In the midst of the storm, he cried out a very simple prayer. Lord... Have mercy. He was struck by his own words. He had little to no time for God, and he cared nothing for mercy. But as he would later say in one of his hymns, sovereign grace has power alone to subdue a heart of stone. And the moment grace is felt then the hardest heart will melt. When John Newton found himself in danger facing what seemed to be a hopeless situation, what was really happening? 
Well, God was bringing John Newton to the end of himself, driving him to his knees. And when this happened, what did he cry? Lord, have mercy. This is a cry of desperation and dependence from the lips of a sinner to the ear of the Savior. And it's a prayer the Savior loves to hear. Newton's cry of desperation and dependence matches the cry of another. He's the main character in the true story that Mark tells us this morning. The details of this man's story are very different than John Newton's. But they both had the same basic need. And therefore, they both cried out the same basic prayer. In so doing, both show us the keys to following Christ. All who come to Christ must come in desperation and dependence. This is not new. You've heard these words already in this series, and you'll hear them again. Last week, Aaron rightly emphasized something we see clearly in the text. Jesus is now on the road to Jerusalem. The time of his death is drawing near. You can feel the tension mounting. And now, out of nowhere, Mark tells us about an encounter between Jesus and a man named Bartimaeus. As I have now studied this story, it seems to me that Mark gives us one dramatic encounter that unfolds in three different scenes. Uh, let's, let's call scene number one, undeniable need. Scene one, undeniable need. We find this in verses 46 through 48. Look at the text with me again. Verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. There is nothing particularly strange about this scene, to be honest. A man who is blind is sitting next to a well-traveled road begging for money. He is poor and destitute, a societal outcast in every way. It wouldn't have been anything out of the ordinary to see a man like Bartimaeus begging by the road. And this road from Jericho to Jerusalem would have been a strategic place for a beggar to be. Countless traveling merchants and religious pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem would have passed right by him. As Bartimaeus heard the sound of voices and the rustle of footsteps, he would have called out, pleading for those walking by to be generous, not so he could have some kind of lavish lifestyle, but so he could eat and survive just a few days at a time. Bartimaeus is a picture of desperation and dependence. His only hope was the kindness of another. Look now at verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Somehow, Bartimaeus not only found out that Jesus was going to be traveling near where he was, but he recognized when he was close enough to hear his cry. He has obviously heard of Jesus before this moment because he knew something about his identity and his ability. Two things the disciples were very slow to grasp. Don't miss that. Think about this poor man. He's been suffering for so long. Nobody loves him. Nobody listens to him. 
but he hears about a man that might be able to help. He has one chance from all we know. So when the exact moment arrives, he cries out to Jesus, acknowledging both his identity and his ability. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, friends, here's what I think is behind the cry of Bartimaeus. I think he's heard about the promised Messiah, and he's heard about this Jesus of Nazareth, and in childlike faith, this outcast exhibits greater understanding than the disciples. He puts two and two together. Everything he's heard about Jesus seems to match up with what the scriptures teach about the Messiah. He concludes then that this man is the son of David. He's the one the prophet Isaiah talked about who would come and make the deaf hear and the blind see. But this promised Messiah wouldn't only be powerful, he would also be kind. According to the psalmist, he would defend the cause of the poor and give deliverance to the children of the needy. Friends, let me say it again. Bartimaeus is a picture of desperation and dependence. His only hope was the kindness of another. Notice how the gathered crowd responds when this beggar cries out to Jesus. Verse 48. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. I don't think there is anything very confusing happening here. It's just as it appears. People have been waiting to see Jesus. He's a celebrity for some. For others, they're still struggling to fully understand who he is. But in any case, the last thing in their minds, the last thing Jesus needs is a worthless outcast yelling at him, distracting him from the people that really matter. Consider carefully what is happening. A blind man is begging beside the road. He has nothing, and in the eyes of the public, he is worth nothing. He struggled and he suffered, and just when he thinks there might be a sliver of hope, he cries out in desperation and dependence. He just wants to get the attention of Jesus. And when he does this, Everyone gathered around Jesus turns to him and tells him to shut up. You can almost hear the disdain in the way Mark records the people's response. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Friends, what does the text say next? Speaking of Bartimaeus, I love this. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. When you have no standing in society anyway, who cares what everyone thinks of you? This is the cry of desperation and dependence by someone who knows his only hope is the kindness of another. Do you see what Mark is doing here? In stark contrast to the rich young ruler, Bartimaeus comes to Jesus with empty hands. He had nothing to offer Jesus. No works of righteousness, no worldly power or influence. He comes to Jesus as a child, desperate for his mercy and totally dependent upon his kindness. He needed Jesus to do for him what he could not do for himself. And nothing's going to stop him. Now, There is one, 
There is one in the crowd who does not join the chorus calling on this blind beggar to shut up and go away. This brings us to scene number two. We'll call this compassionate Savior. Compassionate Savior. We find this in verses 49 through 51. I love what happens next in this story of everything Mark has recorded so far, I think. I think if I had a time machine, this is the moment I would travel to. I think. The drama of Bartimaeus crying out to Jesus, the crowd rebuking him, then Bartimaeus cries out again even louder, and as the tension builds, Jesus stops. And I assume everyone else would have stopped as well, and a hush would have fallen over the whole crowd. In the stillness, Jesus says two simple words. Call him. Verse 49. One commentator writes, this is the same thing that happened for the woman with the flow of blood. It seems that the cry for mercy is the sweetest sound to the ears of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, aren't you eternally grateful that the cry for mercy is the sweetest sound to the ears of Jesus? If it weren't, every person in this room would be lost. What a picture of the kindness of Christ's saving work. Each and every believer here was at one point the blind beggar with no hope and no ability to heal yourself in desperation and dependence. All you could do was cry out for mercy. And when you did, a compassionate Savior heard you and he did for you what you could not do for yourself. That's what we find next. Back to verse 49. In obedience to the directions of Jesus, they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now I know, I know this is obvious in the text, but don't miss the startling contrast between Jesus and the gathered crowd. When confronted with the desperate cry of a blind beggar, the crowd tells the needy man to shut up, but Jesus tells him to get up. In this contrast, the actions of Jesus reveal what false religion looks like. One of the surest ways to spot a religious fraud, someone who talks a good spiritual game but has never been transformed by Christ, and you can find these people anywhere. Sometimes you can even find them in your own mirror looking right back at you. A religious fraud doesn't care about the very people that Jesus seems most drawn to. the weak, the vulnerable, the poor, those who have nothing to offer him or anyone else. This is why Jesus said to his disciples back in chapter nine, as he took a child and put him in the midst of them, Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is also why the brother of Jesus said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Now, 
Now back to our text. Please, please don't miss this incredible scene, especially in verse 50. Friends, again, this is childlike faith. This is a dependent and expectant child who runs into the arms of a loving parent without reluctance or reservation. This is a picture of humble trust and hopeful faith. Notice that Mark, who is usually brief and to the point, gives us an unusual amount of detail when he describes how Bartimaeus came to Jesus. When he was told to take heart and get up, Mark says that he threw off his cloak, jumped to his feet, and came to Jesus. Now, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and claim something that the text doesn't explicitly say. I think I'm safe in saying this, though. Here it is. I think Bartimaeus was really, really excited. Wouldn't you be? This one who he's crying to has heard him, responded to him. Friends, we're supposed to see something more than his excitement. One theologian observes, the fact that Bartimaeus left his cloak is significant. Why? He knew he would not need it anymore. He used his cloak to collect money, like a musician who lays out his guitar case for people to throw in their coins. By faith, he now believes he is as good as healed, and he doesn't need it anymore. Mark is also showing us that Bartimaeus fits the pattern of a true disciple. You see, disciples leave everything to follow Jesus, The rich man was not willing to leave his wealth, but Bartimaeus was happy to leave behind what little he actually had. When we see what Bartimaeus does here, we are meant to examine ourselves. If you're not a follower of Christ, this is a plea to you. Lay aside anything and everything that might be keeping you from coming to Jesus in desperation and dependence. You need what only Jesus can give you, and there's nothing you can do to earn it. You must come as a beggar, crying out for his mercy. And once again, let me remind you, the cry for mercy is the sweetest sound to the ears of Jesus. If you are a follower of Christ, this is a good reminder that you need to remain desperate and dependent. Yes, when you come to Christ in faith, he makes you new, forgiving your sin and securing everlasting peace with God. But even as you walk through life as a disciple of Jesus, you you never get over your need for him. You never graduate from dependence and desperation to self-sufficiency. Every single day you run to Christ as a child. You pray and plead for his grace and his power to Keep following him by faith. So whether you need to come to Jesus or you already have, I want you to see this. The actions of Bartimaeus tell us something about Jesus, don't they? You don't leave everything and throw yourself upon the mercy of someone unless you're convinced They're sympathetic and strong. You see, Bartimaeus needed someone who could both hear him and heal him. And Jesus alone could do both. Again, whether you need to come to Jesus or you already have, we all need to see Jesus as Bartimaeus does. 
Isn't it interesting that that's one of the main lessons? That we need to see Jesus the way a blind man sees him? We need to see Jesus as Bartimaeus does because this is who Jesus really is. He is kind enough to hear your cry. And he is powerful enough to make you new. He is kind enough to hear your cry. And he is powerful enough to make you new. Before we move to our third and final scene, I want you to notice something else. Look at verse 51. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Friends, look back at verse 36 in this same chapter. We studied it last week. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks Bartimaeus the very same question that he just asked James and John. Now, how did James and John answer the question? They ask for the best seats in the kingdom. How does Bartimaeus answer? With a simple and humble request. Jesus, I just want to be able to see. I just want to be able to see. As you've heard now numerous times, let me say it again. Bartimaeus comes to Jesus in childlike faith, desperate and dependent, knowing that his only hope is found outside of himself. His undeniable need can only be met by a compassionate Savior because this compassionate Savior acts upon him with amazing grace. That's what we'll call the third and final scene, amazing grace. Undeniable need, compassionate Savior, amazing grace. Look at verse 52. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, friends, don't misunderstand Jesus' response here. He is, not, he is not saying that Bartimaeus was healed because of something he did. No, this blind beggar was healed by grace alone. But Jesus is acknowledging the authenticity of Bartimaeus' faith. He really believed. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and he believed that Jesus had the power to heal him, and that's precisely what Jesus does. As soon as Jesus speaks to Bartimaeus, he can see. There was no process he had to go through, no steps he had to take. When Jesus speaks, the blind man sees. Imagine what that would have been like. The years of total darkness. The sense of hopelessness. The disdain he felt from others. The constant daily begging. In a moment, it all changed. And it wasn't simply his physical condition that was transformed by the power of Christ. No, where, where we have that phrase, made you well, some other translations simply use the word heal. In, in any case, the word can also be translated save. This man has experienced both physical and spiritual transformation, and it's all of grace. Amazing grace. How do we know Bartimaeus has been transformed into a genuine follower of Christ? Well, when the healing comes, he doesn't take off to see all the stuff he hasn't been able to see. 
He, he wasn't immediately overcome with the desire to fulfill all his personal dreams and aspirations, which would have been totally normal in one sense. Friends, what does Bartimaeus do when he encounters the grace of Jesus Christ? He leaves everything and what? He follows him. This is what a true disciple does. A disciple is one who comes to Jesus empty-handed, desperate and dependent, humbly crying out to a compassionate Savior, knowing that his mercy and grace is the only hope. And when the Savior hears the earnest cry and answers, a true disciple's response is really quite simple. Follow him. Leave everything and follow him. He's absolutely worth it. He's absolutely worth it. We began this morning with a brief sketch of, of John Newton's early life. That time when he reached the end of himself and cried out to God for mercy. And given the wicked lifestyle that he had embraced and the sinful slave trade that he participated in, Newton had a profound sense of the depth of his sin. This also means that as a recipient of God's undeserved kindness in Christ, Newton also had a profound sense of the grace he had received. Those two worked together. Of course, this led him to write perhaps the most famous of all Christian hymns, and we sang it earlier. Amazing grace. As I study the story of Bartimaeus this week, I begin to wonder, what would Bartimaeus have been like after he met Jesus? Based on what Mark tells us, I think it's safe to assume that he was a man marked by an overwhelming sense of joy. As he traveled with Jesus and began to tell people his story, I would guess... I would guess it sounded something like Newton's story. In fact, maybe you picked up on this when we were singing. The first stanza of Amazing Grace would have been perfect for Bartimaeus. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Brothers and sisters, these words aren't just perfect for Newton and for Bartimaeus, but they are perfect for every Christian. But how does one get to this point? How does one get to the point where this is their testimony, where this is their song? It is only by coming to Jesus as a beggar, desperate and dependent. Your only hope is the kindness of another. Someone who can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You need a compassionate savior, one who overflows with amazing grace. Friends, this is Jesus. So run to him. Let's pray.